Yes, well, I'm just going to kind of get started now. Um, thanks for coming, all eight of you. Uh, all eight of you, uh, either philosophy junkies or other kinds of junkies for today. Um, it's, it's pretty informal. I'm just, I like the lecture because it makes me seem cool and interesting. I was one of the same kind of lecture, so here we go. Drink the film. Um, just so I get a sense of what we're dealing with, I wouldn't actually write a Huxley at all. I've read a little bit of the doors of perception. But what's, what's a little bit like? Uh, a couple chapters. It was back in high school, though, so I'm not super familiar with it. Yeah, I don't. I don't need to come saying. Actually, I usually like every two days. I'm like, yeah, I read that book. Um, all right. Well, pretty pretty basically, um, this is way more. I like to do it even more informally than we usually do. So please do not raise your hands. This is not a fucking classroom. First of all. Second of all, um, just stop me any anytime I get bizarre or too far out there. Or any other questions or anything, or you want to interject something? Um, I, I guess we should probably begin with: Are there any people who, who know someone who identifies as a mystic or who knows also a mystic or reads mysticism? You know, texts. You over? No, no one. Okay. Um, well, I, I put it pretty basic. If, if you guys did the, I, I felt it would be um, derelict of me not to do like the five-minute search it would take to look up the Wikipedia uh, Center, the Encyclopedia of Philosophy Definition, and they have a very long jargonistic definition of what mysticism is, but it's pretty much uh, boiled down to that, which is um, mysticism comes from the Greek word, which means to conceal or to be concealed. And all forms of mysticism more or less um, can abide by that definition of there, which is the, as you can read, the experience um, of things which are concealed. Uh, so prior to prior to uh, Huxley writing his little treatise, the Doris of Perception, which I don't have here, or the Korean philosophy and heaven and hell, which is Kind of going along with the doors of um, the, the change, the definition of mysticism had undergone a slight change. So by the 19th century, it had um, it had kind of undergone a constriction, a narrowing of, of what it meant. In the beginning, the, the term was coined in like the 14th century, somewhere around there, and it existed for longer. But um, it had essentially become a term that you can just apply anything that's that's esoteric or kind of bizarre by nature. Um, so by the 19th century, it meant very specific set of doctrines, which essentially are the um, uh, the result of the influence of the Eastern and Western philosophy, kind of intermingling. Um, but by the 19th century, we see guys like William James. Uh, I don't know if any of you heard him. The religious experience, the variety of religious experience, which is um, taken to mean something like mystical experience, the two terms are taken to be inter interchangeable. Um, he wrote he wrote it, um, and for him. He put something like uh, religion is a feeling of the infinite or the divine of, of the numinous, the transcendent, something like that. Um, and, that and that's really where uh, Albus Huxley seems to be carrying on the torch that was lit by James. I think that's one way of putting it. He's, he takes up this uh, this tradition with, with, with um, mixed with something called perennialism, which is very heavily um, emphasizes the East versus West tradition. Kind of Intermingling. So there's um there's three books: the Doors of Perception, Heaven and Hell, Perennial Philosophy. Um, the Doors of Perception, by the way, just for any of you want any um, factoids or anything, was taken from uh, Wayne Br 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 Blake's phrase. Do you guys know Wayne Blake, the philosopher, who said something on religious experience? He said something like, um, "All human beings craft their deities out of poetic fantasy, out of poetic tales." And in so doing, forget that all the ideas reside within the human breast. Um, so it's, it's another hint at universalism. But the doors of perception, by the way, is also where um, where they get the doors of the popular six of man took their took their uh, title. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna gloss over that one because I I don't really I don't have it with me. Um, and I'm gonna read just a really brief passage. I promise from the introduction to the perennial philosophy, which is kind of like a, the undergirding to or highlights something like the other to the other books, which is where we'll get to the next little bit. The reason why you all came, I know. Um, so he says something like this in introducing the term. Um, Philosophy at Perennius, the phrase was coined by Lebanese. Um, but the thing, the metaphysic that recognizes the divine reality is substantial to the world of things and lives uh, lives and minds. The psychology that finds in the soul something similar to or even identical with divine reality. The ethic that places man's final end in the knowledge of imminent and transcendent. The ground of all being, the thing, is the immortal and the universal. We 
myths of perennial philosophy can be found among the traditionary lore of primitive peoples in every religion in the world, and it is fully developed in <coughs> in its fully developed forms. It uh, has a place in every one of the higher religions. A version of this highest common factor in all preceding and subsequent theologies was first committed to writing work 25 centuries ago, and since that time, uh, the inexhaustible theme has been treated again and again, the standpoint of every religious tradition in all of the principal languages of Asia and of Europe. Um, and so again, we have just this highlighting of the universal. So if, I don't know if any of you have, have heard the, um, the really vapid saying, like, I'm, I'm not spiritual, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. It's, it's kind of a it's kind of a knockdown of that that type of thought. It's essentially that the two are one and the same. Um, and furthermore, it's the fact that there's universal. So, is there any, does anyone have any thoughts? Or, feel free to interject at any time. No. Okay. Well, I'll keep going then. Um, one of the more interesting uh, undergirdments of this idea is this uh, is the concept as it continues on here that knowledge is a found as a function of being. And we might contrast that to say uh, some of the earlier philosophers, say um, Plato. Has anyone read a lot of Plato, Socrates? Everyone's read a little bit, right? Does anyone remember the, um, the education is memory bit? Yeah, I see a couple. Yeah. Um, so if you juxtapose it to that, you might say um, for for Plato and Socrates, all things exist platonically, right? There's, there's these all, all these ideal states, and all that we have to do is connect with the memory that each being has of those states. But for um, but for Huxley and some of the other perennials, the idea is that um, is that knowledge is a form of human transformation. In other words, so you connect with the the divine or the transcendent, and in in in, in connecting with it, you transform yourself into something slightly more interesting. Um, now, there's a couple. I'll, I'm going to introduce some of the skeptics here, really quickly. Um, there's does anyone know Arthur Kessler? He's a he's a writer, last century, kind of minor figure, uh, Darkness at Noon, and a couple other big hits. He writes, he wrote a paper called The Return Trip uh, to Nirvana, which basically just says, this is all bullshit, come on. Like, how the fuck do you know that there's this transcendent thing? Well, how, do, how do we know that you're not making up? And that's kind of the, that's kind of the um, view I take of it. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting bullshit, it's intriguing bullshit. There's, um, and there's a couple others. I think there's one if you if you do the Wikipedia search, they have a nice quote for it, which is um is uh that it's it's a take all, it's a catch all term. Spiritual uh, mysticism and that line of thought is a catch all term for like whatever you can not define or has no meaning basically. Any religious utterance that doesn't mean anything is is uh, mysticism all of a sudden because it gives like this nice loaded air like, well you just don't understand it. Um in Freud's in Freud's I don't know, if you take Freud's take on it was that it was um it was just an expression of the ego and narcissism, pure narcissism in its purest form. Um, and that it was um, it was a shrunken residue under <coughs> which kind of shrinks under realities of or something like that. Wait, what was that? The it's, it's itself. A, uh, no, sorry, the, the mysticism of anyone is, is um, in this whole line of thought that I would say things up. It's just um, meaningless, basically. And it kind of shrivels and dies when it's put up against the reality. So, um, but, you, but it is popular, I should mention, it is very popular. And you see it in a lot of early intellectuals like Newton, for example. Um, he believes that somehow God underwrites mathematic, mathematics and that what, you, what you're doing when you're trying to distill mathematical um, equations and things is you're actually trying to glimpse the mind of God or something like that. All right, Spinoza too is a big one on this. Um, and so, and, and so if, you, if you put the two together, you have something like this. The one, the one side is saying that there's this fundamental truth to which normal reality is uh, shut out of. Um, and some kind of evanescent truth. And then the other side is saying that this is just um, philosophical emollients. It's, it's meaningless, but it, it soothes people. It makes yeah. it feel good to know that they're somehow in contact with the divine. And so when Huxley goes on his tour for some of these books towards the end of his life in Oxford, he draws these huge crowds. Um, for obvious reasons, they were interested in how, how they can I can say, well, really, when I'm taking PFA or Escalade, for example, it's just it's my attempt to contact the divine being or something. Or they, or they were actually just curious. Um, and so I'm going to read a little, a little bit further, probably not too much, and then I'll like to see if you guys have any thoughts at all about, about it. And I'll recap the actual argument that he has or that he gets at. 
because the thing about Huxley, if you read them, is it's, all, it's mostly rhetoric. And it's very rhetorical. And so there's no, there's no um, Spinoza or Wittgenstein in like where they literally list out. This is my, this is my argument in proposition form. There's none of that. Um, so I'm going to read one more passage real quick, and then we'll get into that. Um, and this is on the concern of the, his book. He says, the current philosophy is primarily concerned with the one divine reality substantial to the manifold world of things um, and lives and minds. And uh, moving on, he, he goes through like, a lot of extended metaphors. I'll skip over it. Um, in, in regard to a few professional philosophers and men of letters, there is, um, uh, is there any evidence that they ever did much the way of fulfilling the necessary conditions of direct spiritual knowledge, uh, which he means accessing this divine uh, thing? Um, when poets or metaphysicians talk about the subject matter of the perennial philosophy, it's generally at second hand. But in every age, there's been some men and some women who's, uh, who choose to fill the conditions upon which alone, as a matter of proof and empirical fact, such immediate knowledge can be had. And of these few have left uh, accounts of the reality in one comprehensive system of thought, the given facts of this experience with the given facts of the other experiences. To such first-hand exponents of the perennial philosophy, uh, those who knew them have generally given the name of saint or prophet or sage or enlightened one. And it is mainly to these because there is good reason to suppose that they knew what they were talking about. And not to the professional philosophers or men of letters that I have gone through my selections. The rest of the book is um, a selection of quotes and quips from various sages, mostly. Actually, um, a lot of Eastern and Western things, a lot of Christian mystics, and, uh, Hindu, Hindu, Buddhism, especially, seem to be his favorites. But he, he generally avoids I think Meister Eckhart. I don't know if he's a German kind of raving mystic, uh, is as close as he gets to any actual philosophers, and maybe some of Aquinas or something like that, you know, the general. Um, but essentially, all he's saying is that uh, for Huxley, um, the divine element, it's, it's an empirical fact, basically, which is evidenced by its um, perennial expression. So the fact that so many men take these same steps and come up with these similar sayings proof for him that, that there's something in it. So, does anyone have anything on that so far? Well, sort of the, the part that makes me skeptical about this is the extent to which he believed he used masculine and similar substances to access it. Yeah. And that introduces a lot of doubts with what he was actually accessing and, and whether or not it was consistent from substance abuse to substance use, I suppose. Yeah. Um, oh. anyone? So you're asking, like, would different substances produce different sorts of divine truths? Well, there's, there's a couple of different factors involved with it, because uh, obviously went on to use LSD and other hallucinogenics as well. That's going to sort of first exposure to it. Um, and there's this big, this big claim that came out in the 60s during this movement uh, about how set and setting are what determined the experience that you had when you're under the influence of a hallucinogenic. This is like the one provable thing that Timothy Leary really never came up with. Um, and this pretty much holds that the experience you have is dependent on where you are, how comfortable you are, and what your experience and mindset is like going into ingesting substance. And the sense that it determined the trick you have. So if Aldous Huxley is continually accessing something that he believes to be consistent from use to use, then is it really the product of the drug that he's using, or is he really accessing some divine reality, or is it really just a factor of the set setting that he's in when he uses the drug? Because I don't, there are a lot of similar thinkers that went on to try and access this, this perennial yeah, divine to be, to be there, he's probably the most famous. Yeah. Um, I don't know, yeah, LSD's big for LSD in the 60s, he had a whole cult following for years and years and years. But people went on to try and access it through meditation and, and other sort of spiritual practices, yeah. but Huxley himself never moved beyond substance. Yeah, no, um, and and uh, I, I mean, I probably should launch into like heaven and hell and doors of perception because that's where that comes in. But um, that, that's right. Most of those books actually you can read through them are him describing what the trip was like. Like he had a tape recorder and a bunch of people around him, and he tries to recreate the, the feeling of the trip for the most throughout most of the other books. And so you notice things like he you'll notice like uh, the color of this one flower is being so magnificent. It's kind of awkward because there's no one I think here who actually believes in it. Just on the limit that so far stop me if I'm wrong. So it's kind of hard to be an apologist for it, but um, I'll, I'll, I can give you like a really quick Wikipedia version of his um, his argument for that, which is um, 
based on this idea of transcendence and universal um, universal correctness of all religious utterances or whatever they're battling about. Um, so, so basically, look, there's various ways he says to get to access this. Um, there seems to be various ways to access this historically, um, and he takes all sages and prophets, for example, even Jesus Christ or Peter, any of the things in the Bible, as as any of the visions or vision quests or anything that they go on, as being evidence of accessing some kind of divine reality. He says there's various ways to do this. Um, the most common are deprivation. And further, he says, I believe with neurology, I can pin it to certain chemical. Um, I'll, read, I'll read you like a sentence in a bit, which says exactly this, but I can pin it down to chemical um, changes in the brain. So if you if you affect the brain enough and you cut off, it seems like you're cutting off the chemical activity, so you're reducing actually the capacity of the brain at the time. But in reducing this capacity, we open up um, this, this, um, this transcendence. Most of the obvious objections, I'm sure, are coming to some of you guys. But one of the ways, one some of the ways that have been that have been done, and this is this is what he describes all saints, all prophets as being essentially as doing. And the way they usually do this are for deprivation. So you go live in a cave for a month or something like that. Don't eat, don't speak to anyone, don't, don't um, complete sensory deprivation. You don't hear anything, you don't see anything, you try not to smell anything, um, and such, so on and so on. But um. The other way he thinks that you might be able to do this because it's just a chemical balance. Obviously, drugs can, uh, you can chemically alter the brain states of drugs, particularly um, peyote and uh, which which is uh, whose main ingredient is mescaline, and that's the one that he really latches onto. Although he does kind of fade away from that and move into others. And um, LSD was a big one for Timothy Leary and someone who was a follower of Huxley's uh, early on. Although the two split, I think later on in Huxley's life. Um, one of the ways that you should be able to do this is, is drugs. So you take you take the drugs, it alters your brain state, and you're accessing this shroud, or you're lifting the veil, basically, of, of the constraints of rationality on the mind, or something like that. Um, and here I'll read you I'll read you the sentence or two in which he renders some of this in the beginning of uh, Heaven and Hell. A person under the influence of mescaline or uh, the surgic acid will stop seeing visions when given a large dose of uh, nicotinic acid. This helps to explain the effectiveness of fasting as an inducer of visionary experience. By reducing the amount of available sugar, uh, fasting lowers the brain's biological efficiency and so makes possible the entry to, into consciousness of material possessing no survival value. Moreover, by causing vitamin deficiency, it removes from the blood that known inhibitor of visions, nicotinic acid. Uh, another inhibitor of visionary experience is ordinary, everyday perceptual experience. Experimental psychologists have found out that if you confine a man to a restricted environment uh, where there is no light, no sound, nothing to smell, and if you put him in a type of bath, only one almost imperceptible thing to touch. The victim will very soon start seeing things, hearing things, and having strange uh, bodily sensations. And then he kind of goes, goes on about that. And he, he gets a little worse for those of you who are already. Yeah, he goes on to the reason that Freud, or one of the reasons that Freud becomes fairly pressing is because he starts going into the interpretations of dreams. And he starts saying things like, um, Psychology is found two third uh, two third of dreams are in colors, something like that, right? Um, according to him, uh, or sorry, are in black and white, and only one third actually in color. And he starts to say that the color in the dreams is actually part of the the um, the other the other worldness is like the, the the normal body's desire to experience the other worldness. Um, and this is supposed to be evidenced by the fact that when you when you take mescaline or something, you become completely obsessed with the most mundane colors, or texture, or look, or something. I don't see how he's making like the jump. So he, he thinks that these chemical changes in the brain, whether from deprivation or drug use or other things, um, cause causes these visions or hallucinations. And uh, like I don't see how he makes the jump from that to thinking that those are like some like divine world rather than just like the known side effects of the substances he's taking. Sure. Um, yeah. It doesn't just seems like the gap in the logic. Yeah, that would be, actually, that would be my comment too, that the more obvious thing is probably just that all mystical visions are um, chemically induced, for example. But he seems to think that um, based on the, that there is some truth value to these um, uh, historical religious experiences for the reason that most people will give you. So they happen in all these different cultures, which have no contact with each other uh, perennially and over time 
there's people who never knew each other and they're almost similar or identical. And so there's supposed to be some, there must be some kind of truth value to them or something. So you can say, you can be reductionistic and materialistic about this. And we can do what me and you are likely to say and say, well, that just means probably that all, they're all going to be used and that none of them are real. And there's no spirituality, right? Um, or you can say, you can say that there's, um, there is something to them, that there's some kind of divine um, undergirding, underpinning that underpins all religious experience, which is where he's taking it. It's supposed to be like a corrective push for um, away from the scientific and technocratic tendencies that a lot of modern science has. It's like an alternative scientific view. It's neither or view. His claim about deprivation is to some extent that the physical brain is sort of like a filter that holds back a lot of these spiritual experiences, right? So, so by decreasing faculties of the brain you're increasing spiritual experience so shouldn't that be to some extent sort of uh, investigatable by neuroscience and we know somewhat from neuroscience that when you decrease a lot of faculties in the physical brain you decrease experience and I think my reading on this is a little bit superficial but at least with psilocybin I think that's supposed to be increased brain activity so I think that would uh, contradict his claim a little bit um, yeah. everybody else has read more on and stuff, but I think that would be fairly pertinent. Yeah, I mean, you might be ready to say that. It, um, it's, it seems to me, uh, he's, he takes himself to be saying not any change in brain chemistry or any reduction yeah, because, because of, yeah, because anything we need for the change in chemistry in the brain to some right. extent, right? So we aren't all, you couldn't, in that sense, you'd always be experiencing these transcendent moments. But he takes himself to be saying, Something like these ones are known to cause hallucinations, and what you have know, hallucinations. Um, I think he, he thinks he's leveraging neurobiology and neuroscience. Yeah. Uh, when he has these hallucinations, these are the brain changes that are going on through this reduction, and so this somehow. I guess the question would be whether he has enough evidence to really establish the causal link. Yeah. I think during his day, it wasn't the neurobiological foundation to explore the evidence, and a lot of, for him, the interesting. Research is related to the field of psychology and kind of hallucinogenics were almost a deconditioning agent that would allow more sensory input than like the traditional psyche would allow into perception. But I think that his claims might be at risk because they occur in the neurobiology of research. Yeah, it um, interests me a little bit, especially if you read um, there's, there's a guy called Hang Sen. Yeah. You had a um, philosophy of science in your life? No, but I'm just, I'm starting reading it now. Oh, so I'm Paul, Paul, oh, Davies? Your name is Davies, is in love with him. Um, yeah. He forced me into all the students, that's right. He did, he did, um, he's actually, he's actually good, but he does a lot of, um, a lot of trials on, um, separation. one of his claims in his books, he, he's a neuro, uh, just so anyone who doesn't know, he's a neuroscientist, a neurobiologist, who, um, who spent his whole life trying to research these types of claims. And he says, one of his claims is that love is a, um, I don't know if you got this far, but love is a uh, drug. In other words, because it follows the same marketing systems of, of drug, um, of use of drug um, sedation. So you first you meet someone and you're infatuated with the drug, you become addicted to it, and then and they're supposed to marry each other. But um, it seems to me things like that slightly undercut it because that would mean that these states actually are responsible for social abuse and not for uh, the kind of abstracted. Um, oneness, which you know, there's always, always is um, a uh, retreat from social sanctity and things like that, for example. So I mean, so they all follow the same chemical. So what's to say that Hobbes isn't like we were just saying, just just another chemical state who's saying it's the divine, or the newness, as he puts it. Um, and there's actually a couple of good. I think I mentioned Arthur Kessler's return trip from Nirvana is a good one. So on and so on. So doesn't like posit there being a soul or a spirit that's all like a mental neurological thing? Yeah, not necessarily. He's not an island monster or something like that. He thinks that there's like, this one universal soul that we're all connected to. He doesn't think anything. He's one of the William James Kent, was, which is why he gets that obsession with psychology at hand. It's because he's drawing directly from the psychologist William James, which was the famous, mm. the famous one. Sort of after the period, psychologists were people who were best equipped to research this, I think. Yeah, I'm not going to draw 
because he wasn't a psychologist by training, he was a, a fiction writer. No, and um, actually the whole thing started, this whole thing, this whole experiment started um, when he took mescaline. He, he, um, he agreed to take mescaline for a, for a psychological um, study. And actually, the, one of the books, I can't remember if it was Heaven and Hell or The Doors, but one of those books is actually the direct result, and that's all he's doing. So he was under scientific conditions that he was supposed to take this, um, and the doctor, I think his comment on the book was he's the most um, eloquent uh, specimen I've ever had, but you notice he doesn't actually go with any of the claims that he makes. I don't think. Wasn't it Al Hubbard that gave Huxley the first dose? I think so, yeah. Okay. That's, that's about right. Um, and there's a few, I mean, Dr. Leary, some of the who are viewed as generally cracked by most of the other. We, he took an interesting turn later in his career. Yeah. Um, I think you could talk to Dolphins on LSD. I think one so. of the claims he made. Yeah, Leary? Yeah. yeah, I think so. They got into <laughs> some weird stuff in Millbrook. They, yeah, they got completely disconnected. Uh, I can't think of any substantial. There were some who liked it, some who don't. Most people who liked it are philosophers. Well, Curtis, it's hard to like tell from actual uh, real religious experiences from drug things because I do believe there are actual real experiences, but not like it's, it's hard to tell the difference in there. But like, there's also those near death experiences, like when you're on, on approach of death or actually are technically dead for like minutes and then are managed to be brought back. Who you know have those similar, who all have similar stories about like yeah. yeah I mean, a lot of parapsychology is, I mean, that's parapsychology basically, study of the bizarre things like that. Um, for Huxley, the, the blinding white light, by the way, was a chemical process in place. Maybe an interesting overlap between sort of Huxley and Vasquez, and the religious experience would be sort of the, the primitive, not primitive, but like the tribal uses of substances like Agabane and Ayahuasca in religious rituals. And so, how there's a unique experience that one has when they're under the influence of those drugs in those settings with proper shamans and the proper practices versus using it in a bunch of college kids in that point where you're trying to experience something profound. So there is a marked difference between the use of the drug in that setting and the use of drug in a different setting. And rather whether that's a product of Leary's set setting principle or an actual religious or I guess religious experience as a result of proper preparation is sort of an interesting question. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. He, I think in that small, one of the small passages that he mentioned that it's universal and all tribal, tribal um, primitive, primitive, so called primitive cultures. Um, and I think for him, part of that is the mood and so I think the different mood affects what country you're going to have. So in all the rituals, you notice there's a lot of ritualistic music, like on the death, um, things like that, which just put you in the state, which is primary to thinking. Think peyote, actually, I think is where he derives the message I did. Which is used by the Native Americans a lot for trips. That's its main ingredient, one of them. It's, it's pretty interesting. I, I did want to ask what for you what um what do you have any idea what might differentiate or differentiate or demarcate religious to religious experience? Uh, uh, just since I haven't actually like had grand transcendent, most people don't. But I mean like the people who do seem to really being changed because like like for people that generally do even though it's rare um they are like completely and totally changed which is different from a drug they probably well i mean i suppose they could change that but i mean like a different way and um then like those people who you know are dead like your car whose heart stopped or in a car crash and worked on drugs even and like have and it's like more than just a this similarity of things and what they come up and it's like even people who haven't heard of what other people have gone through and like yeah I know that so no no I'm, I'm, I'm very interested that's so that's I, I, I took it that's part of the reason why I actually thought he can claim there was a divine it was because of the, the lasting effects of some of them because of the universal nature of the Bible, you know? so so um do you have any you said you said um, if 
you've undergone one, you can, you can tell from kind of hearing about them? Is that yeah, but I haven't, so I wouldn't be able to truly claim that. But I mean, like, I, from what I was saying, they, there's like, did they just change, you know, when they just like change dramatically in a more positive way, like changing positive ways. Like, they're not like in a creative way, but I mean, like, they become like nicer and like, yeah, and that stuff like that. There's a certain glow up. Yeah. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. You did just they yeah. walk with a spring in their step. Yeah. I've had, I have um, actually Tartar um, off the record because um, he's a very brilliant guy. He all he buys into this not specifically masculine, but he's a, he's a very religious person who claims to have had OB so out of body experiences, which are very interesting. And he takes the new new mind, which again I think is total bullshit, but he takes the new mind that all of the persistent reality is like underwritten by a single hand, as it were, of deity. So more intelligent people than me believe in these types of things. Take away that, uh, which you will. Does anyone have anything else? How is the philosophy that says that like truth is subjective, or subjectivism? <laughs> subjectivism? <laughs> yeah, wait, what is that specific? Like, nice, nice and easy to remember. Um, well, it depends. So there's uh, relativism and subjectivism get confused a bit, sometimes in my experience from people. Okay. Subjectivism is literally that um, the, the world, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, um, but the world, um, essentially, essentially, my understanding is that nothing exists but what, what you subjectively perceive, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that affect? That's, that's probably true. I don't, I don't have an exact definition. Yeah. Whereas relativism, just saying that um, that, uh, experience, that uh, experience is all underwritten by relative understandings, things, something like that. Okay. If you wouldn't be anything, you might find out I'm wrong. So you know, and then there are all the postmodern uh, traditions, which are deconstructions of our notions of truth, which are also anti-objectives. Yeah, not, 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 not anywhere in the objectives. Yeah, no, no, no. Because I was thinking, sort of like the conviction that people have when they go on these drugs of these divine shoots might sort of make us skeptical of our own normal experiences. And maybe, at least in my opinion, it kind of like makes me look towards subjectivism. It's maybe true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we had, um, we did, I think last year when Tom was here, uh, we did uh, one whole thing on uh, real world skepticism. Uh, were you there for that Yeah. It was one of the few I was there for, but um, there was a couple of people, I think, that kind of did. I don't think we convinced anyone out of stuff this time, actually. Really? Yeah. yeah no, I think that's, 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 right. that uh, that's where we left it, after like an hour of a furious devil's advocating, but then everybody was just like, oh, we all, we all agree, skepticism. <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember that. Um, there was a couple, there was like two or three people there who seemed to actually buy into it a little bit, right? I, yeah. Was just a, yeah, I think so. Buy a, to buy into other, other world skepticism, or sorry, real world skepticism, which is like how do you know what is real, where it comes from the, the thing. You can run an argument like taking the brain to the bat, because everyone say, how do I know which of it's real? Well, I, I think we all agreed that it wasn't disprovable, but that most of us don't live like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's really you can't live like that. Yeah, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's, um, there's one guy that seemed to really, really like the idea of the real world skepticism. I don't remember. He only came to one meeting. But actually, that's that, that actually kind of elucidates the difference between us, the brain and the bat. Yeah. So, the brain and the bat is subjectivism. Is it subjectivism? Yeah, I think it, no, it's the, it comes from the Descartes. Oh, okay. It's a for Descartes thing that makes help. The only thing he can really believe in is himself. Because uh, uh, <laughs> God underwrites it. So, for, for someone like that, God underwrites it. As for where, if you were just a real world skeptic, um, you don't really need that. Same with um, a lot of these. A lot of these. There's um, we you can be like like um like me and say, well maybe maybe it's just material after all. I don't see any reason for buying it to the spiritual. Or you can be like, oh, I'm it's like God for the reason. But then like, the question for me is always on what evidence. Right? Yeah. Unless you have any really compelling, any of you here have any really compelling evidence for God, like ten minutes. 
So or not just have any transcendent. If Huxley, even if you can reduce it to what, everything can material, if Huxley's claim that drugs are sort of like a shortcut to the neurochemical you know, whatever's that produces experiences, do we think that that in some way undermines the validity of these experiences across different cultures and are like European and Christian mystics any more right than sort of Western drug users and their experiences of the divine? What do you guys think? take that shortcut to a neurochemical state and still have a truly mystical experience or is it just kind of like moving colors and hallucinations? Well, yeah, if you take the, the view that Huxley has of the brain as a filter, then I don't really see why not. But it's just a different way of, I mean, meditation is one way of calming the brain down. Drugs are another way of calming a certain part of the brain down. So, I think if you believe the brain plays that role, I suppose so. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, like, I don't have a very deep understanding of it, but superficially, I feel like it's all about the brain. So, like, the drugs will be the same thing as, like, meditating for months in a cave. Although I do know, like, Tibetan Buddhists don't believe in taking drugs. Yeah. So they don't like that. Actually, in, in Buddhism, there's, uh, like, whole lines of thoughts, which are basically just that, like, the way that you reach nirvana is not by pursuing it, but really by doing the opposite, and then you just sort of accidentally get there sometimes. So you, you put yourself into the situation, like, like the cave, like the forbidden, and then eventually, at some point, I'm like, whoops, I kind of stumbled into enlightenment. Accidentally, like, um, Yeah, yeah, and I know there's, there's whole schools of aesthetics, I guess, that would cause the souls of bodily harm for the same purpose, like, which is the chemical state of the brain, which is supposed to allow you to So there's like the Sufi aesthetics or the Islamic ones who will like drive stakes to their ears their flesh. The, the Catholic ones are famous for um, trying to replicate the, uh, they did the various uh, sufferings of Jesus when they're trying to, trying to get close to God. That's like, stigmata. What? Stigmata? No, um, no that's a re that's where the things just magically appear on your hands. You know? uh, that's an actual Francis. Well, yeah, Francis of Assisi actually was um, part of the reason he was taken to be so holy was because he had the stigmata at the end of his life. He was taken to be representation of Christ in his body or something like that. So there's all kinds of different schools. It's really popular in the New Age kind of movie uh, out of body experience crowd. Where's the taste connection? Yeah. There's also also um there's a lot of there's actually some atheistic literature which take some of these arguments that come to the opposite conclusion, right? All religions are supposedly untrue or something like that. Which I think is Huxley's, Huxley's worthwhile because if you've ever heard the term agnostic that was coined by his, um, I want to say his granddad, uh, his granddad, uh, Thomas Huxley, who's Darwin's old dog, famously, the person who won the original debates on evolution. Um, so it's a very, it's a very um, secular world view in a way, and very religious in another way. So he's kind of, he's a kind of seeker, seeking a religious experience through secular means. Thinks it comes to it. Some people still do think he can do it. There's not many. So, I would say a reason or an argument for there being a divine aspect to it? Um, so, like, the strongest argument was just the affective state that you were under when you were like, so you perceive such a strong divine presence allegedly under these substances. And that's universal across all different sorts of views. There's a bunch of data on that. Psychologists have gathered, but I don't think he has any, any metaphysical argument for it. It just seems like the experiential claim. It's not um, what well, you have every hang set in the same days when you talk about affective states. That's one of his yeah. favorite words to hear around them. It's the affective state. Um, but yeah, that's things are. I think for him, it's like the sheer existence, the mere existence of these, um, the same philosophy that crops up in, again universally. But for him, universally, in terms of region and time, over time, over place, suggests that it must be have, there must be something. There's a good reason to think there's something to it, a better reason to think there's something to it, and there's nothing to it. Something like that might be like if you were to distill this. Um, 